the things that technology can never really touch, which is the human spirit and imagination. Welcome to the Smarter Building Materials Marketing Podcast, helping you find better ways to grow leads, sales, and outperform your competition. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Smarter Building Materials Marketing, where we believe your online presence should be your best salesperson. I'm your host, Beth Popnikolov. I have a guest co-host with me today, our Director of Growth, Steve Coffey. And we have someone in the studio who we literally, you guys have just been like riffing for 15 minutes because we have so many thoughts. I'm really excited to welcome Omar Fagundo. He is the vice president of Railco. He's also the founder of 3D.object.io. And we here at Venvio just love chatting with him about marketing and disruption and technology and the building materials space. So you, you're just in for a great treat of listening into the brains of people who think about these things way too much. <laughs> so Omar, welcome to the show. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. So the topic in the room at this moment is disruption. And Omar was at our event in Denver that we hosted with the Farnsworth Group. And a hot topic there that was you know offline and not on the agenda was our industry is ripe for disruption. And I feel like I just heard the eyes roll of all of our listeners because of how complex we know our industry and the supply chain and specifying to purchasing, to installing, to inspecting, to submitting warranties and building life cycles and getting occupants in and selling that off and who is on first and what's on second. All the reasons we know that technology hasn't just kind of easily been stood up, there's a big butt coming. But isn't that what makes something ripe for tech for disruption uh, is yes. the acceptance of it is the way that it is because it's the way that it's always been. So Omar, I'd love from your perspective, where do you see the biggest either risk or opportunity, I suppose, depending on what side of the fence you're on for disruption in our industry? I think without a doubt, if you start looking at 3D technologies, so I got into this through virtual reality, augmented reality, and the Cambrian explosion that's been going on over the last, just the last year in this space is definitely gonna be disrupting building construction and building materials because they're tied hand in hand in the next three to five years, without a doubt. And any company that could start taking advantage of these technologies is definitely going to have a leg up on their competition because like you said, most people are very comfortable doing everything like they've always done it. And those companies that can start experimenting and figure out how can I apply this one solution that's already available on the market to a problem that I already have, we've always had, those are the ones that are going to see outsized rewards for their efforts. Can I, can I just challenge your thought there? Because I, I want to hear more behind it. 3D, it feels like 3D technology has been on the precipice of breaking into the industry for like five or six years. I would put it actually in a similar category to how I feel about modular construction. When you look yeah. at it from the outside, you're like, this is a no-brainer. Why doesn't everybody do this? There's obviously reasons. There's obvious reasons why everybody doesn't do it, but why hasn't it seen widespread adoption? because of all of the ways that it seems like it introduces efficiencies and answers questions and solves pain points. So I would put that to you about 3D imagery or 3D capabilities. What's the hurdle or what's what's keeping it from you know the floodgates just opening and having this widespread adoption moment? Sure, I mean, if you just look at our industry and the demographics, you're seeing a lot of the old guard retiring, being aged out of our industry, and with them, a lot of their old school methods and ways of doing business and intercoming the millennials, right? We are now, uh, if you're a millennial, you are the majority of the workforce. And now we're being put into positions of power, of leadership, and mm -hmm. we're more open to technology. We are digital natives and we're very comfortable with not only the digital realm, but with changing how things have always been done. And so you look at, you know, uh, you look at. Apple, they're coming out with their headset 
imminently, right? They've been teasing it for the last couple of years. They've been teasing it for like years. Yeah, yeah, Years. Yeah. And it's kind of frustrating for anybody who's, you know, been dying to buy one and actually deploy it. But we yeah. all know that once they put something out, it's going to be special. And I feel like we're kind of waiting for that moment for it to finally take hold. But just look at the numbers and anybody who just, there's a business case for it. There's business case for saving tons of money to ching, right? If you actually deploy this stuff, this is, I mean, like I am involved in building construction projects from the ground up. And so often there are so many rework orders and oversights and things that people just didn't plan for because no one had the vision to perhaps 3D model the entire project from the get-go and think through of all the different things. And this technology has been around forever. So it's it's crazy that I still have to go through 2D plans to bid out something. Uh, but that's another tangent. Uh, so, you know, we, we are ripe for the picking because of a change in the old guard to the new guard. And I think as people start uh, coming online that, you know, are very comfortable with technology, they're going to be way more willing to try something out like an AR or even, um, have you guys heard of NERFs? Nerves are neural radiance fields, and this is a technology that just came out last year through NVIDIA. And so it allows you to take a couple snapshots of anything. For example, I mean, my field, like let's say a gate, right? I take a couple snapshots from a couple different points of view, upload it, and then get a 360. Not only is it a 360 view of it, but it's an immersive view that you could literally look at this gate from every single point of view. I mean, this is crazy technology and it's gone so far in one year that it's nuts. If anybody wants to try something out like that, there's a app out there called Luma AI. You can find it on the app store and have at it. Start experimenting with this because this is the future. This is what's going to set people apart in the very near future, especially if you're up on it and you have your finger on the pulse. So 360 degree view, Images is not new, but for anybody who's never created a 360 degree pro like image for like, you know, having it on your product page on Home Depot or something, it's typically, I think, 27 separate shots, 27, 57. It's something like that, like separate shots. When you're clicking and dragging a paint can in a circle, like every angle of that paint can has been captured. And I know this because I've been part of those projects and had to painstakingly upload each of those exact angles and in the right order, because if you get it wrong, it doesn't work. So the fact that it's like three images to get 360 is is wild, just to give some They brought it there. to the masses. They democratized That's wild. it. They're leveraging AI to basically fill in the blanks between 100%. the three pictures that you took. AI understands, okay, this is a black cast iron gate with this type of latch system and this, you know, like one inch by one inch um, bars or whatever. And so then it knows what the whole thing, that's wild. That's very cool. Yeah. That's wild. Steve, I'd love to know from your perspective, what's your take on what Omar is saying that it's old guard is, has been hesitant and it can't, we can't say everybody hasn't, you know, gone into technology. You're not the first person I've heard say Omar, you know, we know that this is a really important piece. We know this will bring efficiencies. The, lift to get it pushed into the masses at current state is probably not is going to have not the return that we want but in 10 years there will be almost no lift because the generation will have flipped to the next one and the demand will shift steve i'd love to know from your perspective because you talk to hundreds of manufacturers a month maybe more what would what what would your response be to what omar is saying well i i think uh omar you're exactly right in that I feel like we're waiting for that moment when uh, things begin to happen. And I think you had alluded to it, Beth. I don't think there's ever been a, a um, you know, a more likely time for that to happen within this industry. Uh, mm -hmm. There's so much content. There's so much availability of technology. Uh, all of the groundwork is there. And I feel like there has never been a time where a contractor a GC, an architect, an interior designer, or the homeowner, the building owner wants to interact with technology to experience what they're purchasing. Um, I don't think there's ever been a time where that's more prevalent. So 
all of the groundwork is there, the technology is there. I feel like we're just waiting for that moment. And I'm excited to see what that will be. Uh, I am curious though, Omar, as to, um, uh, and, and this is just in interesting to me to think about, what are the old school ways that you think will remain true as we begin to adapt to new technologies? What oh, are those things that question. are going to be carrying over um, the, that the old guard will leave on, right? Uh, that, that, that will continue on. What, what are those things? Well, I think strong leadership, follow-up, an aggressive communication schedule, knowing where everybody's at, those things will never go away. Now, can technology help facilitate that? Absolutely. But I think there, there's definitely the, the work ethic, right? Uh, all that will remain, being analytical, creativity, and imagination. Those are things that technology can never necessarily tap into. Even though you look at some, uh, some new technologies like MidJourney uh, that came out last year, and it kind of helps you generate ideas. Right. So we're just going to be seeing a, a melding, a melting and a melding of technology with the things that technology can never really touch, which is the human spirit and imagination and stick to itiveness. Right. All those things are just always going to be around. And we could just only hope that technology makes it better and makes it easier. And for me, it's also a matter of affordability. Right. I mean, we are a generation that is having a tough time buying a new home. I'm in that bracket and uh, definitely here in the South Florida area, it is tough to find something that oh, man, it's wild. is affordable and uh, reasonable and you don't have to put a ton of work into. I think Beth, the last time I heard you were on the same boat. Same. Yeah. I'm renting right, for yeah. life at this point. I'm not proud, but those are the facts. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. There's a lot of us, right? Yeah, so I think is. it's a matter of, you know, doing right by this generation and the next generation and, and our kids. Uh, to make housing affordable again. And if technology helps us get there, gee, let's go ahead and do it. Steve, I think that question is spot on because it's time to start shifting the conversation from what if technology gets adopted to what do we not have to solve for? And how can we expect what we love about our industry to continue? And Omar, I love all of your responses. I think there's two things I would add to it is one is what you're basically saying to the same thing is relationships. We know that our industry is built on relationships and um, an era that I'm excited to see is to have a dominant generation in our industry that views technology as a partnership to relationships, not a risk to relationships and also not just a tool to be leveraged. But I mean, so most millennials, we remember a significant amount of our lives before the internet. I know that that's not how we're depicted, but I can tell you the day that we got internet in my house and yeah. I was like well into middle school, right? I was well into high school before we had like a dedicated, I think before we had DSL, right? We all remember those moments. So we value the things outside of technology, but we also have seen the, let's just say good sides, we're going to ignore the bad sides of social media for a minute, but we've seen how the benefits of being integrated with technology has extended relationships. We have friendships that we've created all around the world and continued that would typically not have lasted. They would just been very seasonal. And to see a moment in our industry where we can now create technology kind of without barriers, but as a partnership is there's that's where I'm excited to see versus just like, hey, you could replace these people with this tool because that's often how technology is introduced. Right. But like, here's how to your point, Omar, here's how we can make things more efficient. And here's yeah. how we can promote and further what we've been doing. And it's going to create benefit and it's going to create ROI and it's going to decrease prices and increase speed and increase the benefits and build relationships, not attempt to replace them. I think that's, that's really exciting. Absolutely. You had mentioned before we started recording the advent of 3d printed homes. Yeah. Something I'm so interested in, right? Because <laughs> this technology has been around, I think since the eighties with 3d printers, then we all started hearing about it about 10 years ago. And someone said, Hey, what if we started putting cement into this instead of plastic and bam, now all of a sudden you have 3d printed homes. Who would have thought like, three, four years ago, this could have, have ever happened. 
um, I was inspired by one of your episodes with Black Buffalo yeah. and what they're doing. It's just amazing how quickly things could turn around. And and you know, to your point, how we started this conversation, uh, disrupting this industry, not necessarily through the outside, but sometimes you know, just through the inside, and it's just a combination, a hybrid approach, and and seeing where we could get with that, right? Like what happens when we mix three D printers, three uh, D printed homes, right, with a generative AI technology and um, and some augmented reality uh, manufacturing processes, things that are done offsite. And you combine all that stuff together. How affordable can a home possibly be? Oh yeah, right. Yeah. While still maintaining all the relationships. That's exactly where I would love to see our entire industry go. There, uh, to, to what you said, Beth, too, and then Omar, you picked up on a little bit. There's uh, an app that. I was looking at the other day, mosaicapp.com, and it's for engineers and architects, and it's essentially project management. And going back to um, the, the question that I asked, because I think the integration of all those technologies, which you were just saying, Omar, is extremely important. I think that's where you're going to, that's potentially where you're going to see the aha moment is when you have all of these different technologies together. Um, and Mosaic App is AI uh, project management efficiency. So it doesn't, it's not saying we're going to replace a lot of, you know, people in your organization or in your firm, we're just making them better. So we're pulling together a lot of different uh, technologies and we're making them more efficient as individuals so that you can, you can do better projects. But I think also you can have the most amazing, um, let's say on a more consumer oriented pro product, you can have the most amazing 3D software and I can interact with this product and see it in, on my house. You know, if it's siding, I can see it on my house. Or if it's a faucet, I can place it in my kitchen and all this augmented reality stuff. But if I can't buy it effectively, like if I don't know where yeah. to buy it or how to buy it, what's yeah. the point? Oh right? my gosh. So you, you're spending so much money on this software that's not really doing me any good at facilitating the actual purchase. So I think the integration of all of those technologies is probably, that's where I would like to see the aha moment as well. I hear you. Not, not only buy it, but install it, right? I think you guys had someone on your episode. There's something like on your phone with the 3D instruction manual. Oh, built. Right? Where anybody built. can install anything BILT. because they yeah, make it nuts. plummy proof, right? Yeah. 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 That, just add that to the mix, to the workflow. So I guess overall, like if you look at this conversation is not so much new technologies, but, but new workflows, right? How do you mm -hmm. yeah. take A oh, plus a B plus it. D plus D to get, you know, Z. Yeah. I mean, I think to bring the other side of that conversation, Steve, which is you nailed it, which is the consumer side. So we're talking a lot about how do we get technology pushed into the leadership level, the manufacturer level, the builder, the dealer, the installer level. On the consumer level, if we think about the same thing. So millennials are, Omar, you teed this up perfectly. Millennials have the largest buying power of any generation right now. However, like I said, a lot of us remember when life was analog. So we have an acceptance of lack of technology. We don't love it. Like we don't ever want to talk to a human. And we think like driving through a bank line is very weird and things like that. Right. Like I don't I don't want to talk to a person. I love my e-com experience, but we also still leverage like experts and we believe in making those connections. But even we like we're not the young generation right now. And younger millennials don't have that same, that same perspective. Do you know they call us geriatric millennials, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> so hurtful. So disrespectful. Do not Respectful. approve. I do not approve. Right. So <laughs> I was born, I was born in 85. I think I'm like right at the cusp of what you would consider a millennial. Like I'm, I think the oldest millennial is 42. I'm 38. So I'm like right there kind of like at the high end, but the low end of millennials, they don't have that general acceptance. And if we think about the other side of, you know, in five ish or so, let's say five to 10 years, the top portion of leadership that's currently in like the Gen X and baby boomer generation that's going to age out and millennials will start to sit in those decision-making seats. Well, that's going to happen from a consumer standpoint also. And those like younger millennials and older Gen Z, which by the way, older Gen Z is now graduating from college. We all think of them as 12. We're doing to them what everybody did to millennials. Everybody still thinks millennials are 25. Um, Gen Z is graduating from college. They're going into the workforce and they're either on the consumer end of building products as they go in to get ready to buy a house, or they're in the stages of getting ready to look at a career. And they're looking at the building materials world and being like, what? 
Like that doesn't make any sense. Now that's a, that's a broad statement, right? There's yeah. absolutely a huge amount that are coming in, but I was at a, um, I was at a presentation for our local NAHB chapter and they're projecting the need for an additional 61,000 people in the industry every month, every month wow. in the skilled labor sector Ooh, yeah. for the next like two to three years. They need a total of 2 million people over the next five years added to our industry. And there's a, there's a ton of barriers to knock down there, right? I always say my number one idea is like, you just throw money at that problem. You start paying plumbers $250,000 and let's just see what happens, right? But the other piece is technology. Yeah. Gen Z is not coming into an antiquated industry. They're not going to adopt an antiquated career. And you could overcome stigma for Gen Z from like a blue collar perspective a lot faster than you can overcome their absolute disdain for analog life. The inefficiencies just don't make sense, right? So there's there's both sides of the coin that kind of have to be looked at here where disruption is going to happen. And it's this is where startups get this very cool opportunity to just be the Netflix of the situation, like just be growing and be nimble and be optimizing and be innovating while the big guys are like, no, we can't do that. That's crazy. Right. Cause you'll just, you'll get, it'll be a landslide. Like there's huge ripe right. opportunity for disruption from literally all ends. And, and they'll someone blockbustered. Exactly. Yeah. Someone is like any startup I got my hands on at the builder show. I was like, man, I don't know if it's you, but someone's winning this race. I'm right. like, yeah, what, like what you get you like had... the two guys at the tech booth, you know, and they're like, oh, we don't know why we're here. And I'm like, don't give up, man. It's going to be someone. Yeah. Like what if you had a, a plumbing company to your point, right. That just worked completely digitally, right. They had 3d models and they sent out their workers with, you know, 3d AR headsets. They knew exactly where they were, where they were going, where they had to lay the pipe. And it was a kind of a cool job for them where they, they interacted with the real world, right. Cause it's very real world stuff, pipes, cutting saws, right. Um, adhesives but at the same time they have a foot in technology so yeah absolutely to your point and, and that's been kind of a, a going thread a conversation on linkedin you know every a lot of people are talking about you know trades not cool anymore nobody wants to get in them we need more i didn't know about the sixty-one thousand uh jobs per month debt that we deficit that we have going on but the the answer is Fortunately or unfortunately, but it's the reality. It's technology, right? It, yeah. It's going to help us get to more efficient building, get us to a better state of construction, a better housing supply in the United States if we're able to attract the next generation through technology and at the same time implement it wherever we need to implement it. It's everywhere. It's right for the thing. Let's say you're one of those 60,000, right? And you're entering into the industry. Um, on that side... And we could even talk about the manufacturing side. We could talk about the A and D side, but I'm just curious on if you're, if you're one of those 60,000, you're entering um, this industry, what technologies do you need to know? What, what is it going to be good for you to understand and um, have the ability to, to use? What, what, what are those technologies that are important right now? Right. And I think those 60,000 you were talking about, Beth, were like hands-on skilled laborers Correct. that are in yep. the field. Correct. Right. So, so, and I hire some of these guys, right. And I interview for some open positions in my company. So I do get to talk to the younger generation as well as the older generation. And there, there is definitely a, a difference, right. And I think you start overcoming some of these hurdles through training, right. I think mm -hmm. that's something that our industry, if, if you're in the trades, it's kind of been, oh, kind of overlooked, right? It's just, okay, you just get your OSHA training out of the way and send you out into the field and the rest is hands-on training. And I think we have to do a better job as an industry overall to train and to promote, right? Because everyone wants to feel like they're part of something special and they want to feel like there's upward mobility. So it's not so much right. what technology you already know, but what technology mm -hmm. can you learn? Yeah while you're employed at a trades company and a building materials company? How can you level up 
and get to the next place, right? Because nobody just wants to stay in the entry level position forever. That's exactly why nobody wants to work in the trades. Yeah. Because they don't want to just stay as the installer. Well, that's also, I mean, that's part of the problem, right? When we talk to installers or we talk to owners of contracting organizations, the issue is you train them and then nobody wants to stay there and they don't have upward mobility. So everybody becomes their own boss. And that is, I mean, that yeah. is just an avalanche that continues. Yeah. It's valid. I mean, it doesn't feel good. And I, but I don't you get it? Like, I get that. That's a, I mean, that's a problem that we should be looking to solve is not just how do I get you in, but how do I make you feel like you can win and grow once you're here without having to start your own business? Because we've also talked to enough owners of contracting businesses to know it's not a lot of fun. Like there's yeah. a lot, there's a lot of, there's a lot of risk that they absorb. There's yeah. a lot of debt that they have to take on. There's a lot of just stuff that they have to endure that you don't really have to endure lower down, but it's difficult to feel like there's a place for you to go. And that's, I mean, I just think that's really, really, that's a valid feeling from an individual in a, in a job to feel like, Hey, I don't have upward mobility. I got to make my own. Yeah. You see it so often. I see it every day. I mean, I, I, yeah. having a finger on the pulse down here and the very active construction market there's vans everywhere. They pick up a, a little bit of a skill and they want to go off on their own. And the grass is greener. And I end up interviewing some of these people and say, hey, you know, I've been, I thought I could make it on my own. And I just want something stable and something where I could just feed my family and not have to worry about paying the bills. Uh, also valid. And all these expenses and all the things that come with owning a business. Yeah, also valid. Omar, I, I want to change the subject a little because you have this great piece or quote that I've heard you say, which is you are constantly trying to disrupt your own company. You, so you really live and breathe the watchman for disruption in our industry. What does looking to disrupt your own company look like for you? How are you putting that into practice? It's a simple process, right? You take a look around at a broken process, a process that may involve pen and paper, that may involve... <laughs> manual calculations that takes a long time that you don't like to do, but you have to do all the time and you figure out a way to improve it through things that are already available. And the good thing for all of us is every second that passes by, there's more and more solutions out there that you could easily shop around and implement to solve your problems. Some of them are free online. If you just take the time to actually research this. So that's what I do. I mean, it, when I first started with my uh, family, it was, I'm in a family business, right? And my father was doing payroll by hand every other Friday. No. Every other Friday, he would basically lock himself up in his office and with a calculator and calculate out everyone's payroll and handwrite checks. So I came in there. I was like, no, nah, that's not going to work anymore. We got to use QuickBooks and direct deposit. And so that's just one, you know, go for what's right for the picking. Yep. You know, go for what is taking you way too much time, what is causing your principles in your company to take too much time away from the things that they should be doing, which is running their business, like running the actual company, uh, and, and, and take them away from that operational side so they can focus on bigger, aspirational, more vision-oriented tasks. So that's exactly what I've been doing. Uh, so for example, I picked up a piece of technology a couple of years ago with a Grasshopper. So Grasshopper is parametric design software. And I was able to basically go from hand calculating the cost of any railing configuration, because that's what we do, we manufacture. And we also contract install railing systems and pergolas and other aluminum architectural uh, features for new constructions here in Miami. And it's very, people like to get custom, right? With their, with their projects. And so I was having to basically do hand calculations of what this railing configuration was gonna be. So I said, look, there's gotta be a better way. There was a grasshopper, parametric design software. You could go look it up uh, and it allows you to take all your different extrusions. Let's just say all your different pieces, put some business logic behind it, which is not, as difficult as it sounds, and come up with a costing model for what some, anything is going to cost. 
So now I know exactly going to a project, what something is going to cost me, at least materials wise. And that gives me a big confidence boost because, okay, I know this is going to cost me X amount of linear foot. Now I just got to figure out the logistics and the rest of the, of, of the pricing model. So it's, it's just about solving the problems you already have with stuff that's already out there. Omar, we could talk forever because we're both marketing nerds. I really appreciate your time. If someone wants to reach out and get in touch and pick your brain, what's a good way for them to get in touch? Definitely LinkedIn. I love that platform. Um, I'm an avid user. So hit me up on LinkedIn, Omar Fagundo. Um, that's the best place that you could reach me at for sure. Great. That's awesome. So for our listeners, thank you for your time also. And if you want more great content like this, head to venvio.com slash podcast to subscribe. Until next time, I'm Beth Popnikolov alongside Steve Coffey. Peace out.